My name is Daniel Ridland. I'm a fourth year medical student at ETSU, uh, Quillen College of Medicine. Um, I want to talk about a case that was encountered during my third year on an internal med rotation um, of an elderly female who came in with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy after her car stalled. So just a brief introduction, um, Takotsubo or TC is a condition where the left ventricle dilates and at the apex. And so it forms a little bit of a balloon and causes some um, kines akinesis. And the name of it actually comes from a Japanese word um, that translate, translates roughly to octopus trap. And it kind of looks like a vase with a very large rim at the top. Typically it's seen in about one to 2% of individuals when they come in presenting with what's thought to be acute coronary syndrome. Um, but some research has shown that people who have Takotsubo, actually about 15% of them also have acute coronary syndrome on top of that. Um, so it's typically seen in a female individuals that are postmenopausal, um, can happen after emotional stressors, physical stress, or, and sometimes even um, no trigger can be identified. So uh, just like I said, usually females or individuals experiencing it are over the age of 50. Um, some other names for it that we learned were stress cardiomyopathy, uh, the German pronunciation Gibberton is hers syndrome, and then a uh, broken heart syndrome. Um, so like I said, this case will follow a female who came in after she had some car trouble. Uh, so our, our patient was a 76 year old woman, came in, uh, she had a history of fibromyalgia and had, had back surgery recently. I think she was out driving to an appointment and her car stalled in the middle of an intersection. She started to get very stressed, uh, kind of fearing an accident and all the things that could come with that. And then 30 minutes later, uh, she started having some substernal chest pain um, that was very typical of a heart attack. And it kind of radiated around to her back. Um, she also had some nausea and shortness of breath. When she got to the emergency department, um, her vital signs were pretty stable. Uh, but And her physical exam was uh, very benign once they started going through everything. However, when it started running some lab tests, her initial troponin came back at 0.82, which was pretty highly elevated. And her um, ECG showed a sinus, sinus rhythm, but um, with a known left bundle branch block. Uh, after that, uh, or, or sorry, it also showed a SD segment abnormality. So it had some uh, tombstoning and some biphasic um, switching that you can see in the images to the uh, left of the poster. Um, and so she, they kind of went through the ACS uh, protocol, gave her some aspirin, some morphine and heparin. Uh, they watched her, did some repeat troponin six hours later and actually continued to elevate it, went up to 1.53. Uh, so she was actually transferred to a different facility at that point so she could undergo a cardiac catheterization. Um, her cardiac cath, when it came back, uh, showed no blockages in any of her arteries, but her ejection fraction was reduced to 20 to 25 percent, and the left ventricle had the ballooning that's typically seen of TC um, on fluoroscopy. So she was in, a, once the diagnosis was made with those tests, she was discharged, went home with a wearable defibrillator. Um, and then on a typical um, uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction regimen of aspirin, pervadolol, uh, clopidogrel, resuvastatin, spironolactone, or valsartan. Um, I believe she still had some issues with uh, some slightly higher blood pressures and base, uh, due to vasoconstriction and some uh, also some fluid um, harboring. So they switched her over to valsartan secubitril. And then they also put her on paclitflows and during the course of her treatment. Uh, at a three-month follow-up, her ejection fraction had uh, significantly increased back up to 40%, which is very good. Uh, so they took her off of her defibrillator. Um, so just an overall discussion of the case. Um, it's been very well known that people with TC often present with symptoms that are very suspicious for ACS. And so that's why typically uh, when you have someone when you want to make the diagnosis of TPC, you have to undergo uh, some sort of imaging, whether it's a, a CT angio or, or cardiac catheterization. Uh, they can have elevated troponins and uh, abnormal um, uh, ECG findings as well. And then um, we, we don't exactly know what causes TC yet, yet. There are some theories that has to do with levels of catecholamines that come from the stress 
or some sort of other downstream derivative of them that travels through the plasma as well. It could also be due to vaso, uh, coronary vasospasms. We're not 100% sure yet. Um, initially, we thought that TC was benign. And uh, sorry, I was looking at the chat. I saw something pop up and thought maybe I was running over on time. Um, initially, it was thought that TC could be benign. However, there is more data coming out that showing it has high, uh, high death rates, just like ACS, due to some of that, whether it's the reduced ejection fraction or um, some of the underlying ACS that comes along with it that we're seeing in, in a lot of cases. So some known risk factors for TC, uh, death of loved one that's why it's got the nickname of uh, heartbreak syndrome, uh, accidental trauma, uh, stimulant abuse, such as um, cocaine or methamphetamines, um, physical or emotional abuse, natural disasters, or even some financial troubles in life have been cited in cases as well. Um, traffic accidents, kind of like um, similar to what we saw here with traffic troubles. Uh, it's also been noted to be a trigger for TC. And then finally, um, kind of just like I said, uh, stressors that may not seem significant to others can be very significant to some people and cause episodes such as this. So, in conclusion, um, TC can be caused by a variety of triggers. Uh, individuals can often present very similar to ACS and require an ACS rule out on presentation. And then um, the point of cardiovascular workup is pursued. That's how you get your formal diagnosis through imaging. Yes, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I must say, I've had one situation with this before where the patient was under anesthesia and I was about to uh, do a brachial plexus exploration, and uh, usually if people have a catecholamine rush, they'll become extremely hypertensive. This patient's uh, blood pressure just fell into the rocks, and uh, and then once was in the ICU, we aborted the procedure, uh, had imaging similar to this, and then fortunately recovered. Uh, but Dr. Leggett had a question. And I wondered, Dr. Leggett, since you're on the Zoom, you might just ask that in person. And he was asking about uh, uh, further interventions for her uh, emotional stresses, I believe. But Dr. Leggett, would you like to just ask that question in person? Uh, yes, I can address that. I was curious as to uh, if there were any specific interventions made uh, for this patient uh, to address her emotional stressors uh, that seemed to precipitate um, her presentation. Um, to be 100% honest, I'm not sure. I believe there was like an inpatient psychiatric consult uh, given, but, and, and I think that would be very necessary given the situation. I think it would be um, very pertinent to her to have like a multidisciplinary approach and get her the help she needs, especially with um, dealing with stress as it comes, given that we now know she has this condition. Thank you. Thank you.